Hiya, I'm Ang Harrod and this is my third video on the PAT and second lesson where I will be talking about calculus. Um, if you're coming from my previous video, congratulations, that video was extremely long. Uh, so well done if you got through it, but I will try and keep this one much shorter. Um, I would just say as a precursor before I start, if you have never studied calculus before, I would suggest that you go and watch some other videos before you watch this one um, as an introduction to calculus because I'm not really going to be dwelling much on how to um, differentiate and integrate. I'm going to be kind of assuming that knowledge but I will try to put some links somewhere uh, to other videos that will help you learn it from scratch if you need that. Hi it's me from the future. Um, this is a really good video to watch if you are learning calculus from scratch. It's an uh, introduction to calculus by Eddie Wu. Really good. Again, like in the first syllabus, uh, there's skills that you need for more complex questions. So, for example, there were very few questions that were differentiating um, polynomials. And normally you do that as part of a more substantial question. So that is what I will be going through. I'll be going through some more substantial questions um, that use these skills. So the first topic is uh, differentiation and integration of polynomials. And this first question asks you to differentiate the expression x sine x squared. Um, and I thought this was a really good place to start because it has examples of all sorts of differentiation skills that you will need to know and be comfortable with. So the first thing that I did was I named this expression y because I feel like sometimes it's just easier to say y equals x sine x squared so that you can differentiate y. So that's what I did. I said y equals x sine x squared. And then in order to differentiate this, there are a few different rules that we need to use and know how to use. Um, and the first one, is called the product rule. And we have to use this one because uh, our expression is a product of two different things, x and sine x squared. Hi, this is Future editing me. Just to specify, you use a product rule if they're two functions of the thing that you're differentiating by. So in this case, we're differentiating with respect to x and both x and sine x squared were functions of x. Say uh, we had five times sine x squared. You wouldn't need the product rule for that because five is not a function of x. So we need a rule to be able to handle that. And this would be it. And it says that if your y is some function of x f and uh, multiplied by some function of x g, then uh, the derivative of y would be the derivative of f multiplied by g plus f multiplied by the derivative of g. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this rule, there are plenty of derivations and things online for you to understand it from first principles, but it is just one that you'll need to remember or be comfortable using for your pet. If you're unfamiliar with this rule, it's useful to write down what your terms are. So here I wrote down uh, that f of x is our x from our x sine x squared and g x is sine x squared. And this first one, x, is very easy to differentiate. Um, if you are unsure on how to differentiate um, a polynomial, then say y is x to the power of n, then y prime is n x n minus 1. So I use that rule to say that you know, this is technically x to the power of 1. So I've brought the 1 down, I have minus 1 to get one. Now for this other side, uh, sine x squared, it is not as simple as just pulling down a power, unfortunately. Uh, we are going to have to use a different rule. So if you've done uh, calculus before, you're probably aware that the derivative of sine x is cos x, and the derivative of cos x is minus sine x. But in this case, we don't have x, we have x squared, and that does complicate things slightly. In this case, we're going to have to use what's called the chain rule uh, or function of function, I think some people call it, uh, but chain rule is what it's most commonly known as. And this says that you have to differentiate this thing as if this wasn't a function of x first. So that would change to cos x. And then you have to multiply it by 
the derivative of the thing uh, of the function inside that function. So in this case, 2x. So that's what I've done here. I've just said the derivative of sine x is cos x. So for sine x squared, we say it's cos x squared. So ignore this first part, multiplied by the derivative of that, which is 2x. So if we pop that back into our outline of our product rule, um, we have these four terms. We have f of x as x. We have f prime as one. We have g of x as sine x squared. And then we have g prime as 2x cos x squared. Then we just use our product rule, which is essentially just cross multiplying these and adding them together. And you get your answer. There will come a point where you don't need to write everything out anymore and you can just say, okay, well, we're differentiating x to get one, and then we keep sine x squared the same. And then we add on, keep x the same, and then differentiate sine x squared. But of course, sometimes it can be easier to just write it all down in order to save yourself from easy mistakes. Okay, so this next question is a little bit more uh, interactive. There's quite a bit going on here. It's including binomial expansion. It's just got quite a lot going on. So what it's asking you to do is, given this integral here, how many terms of this do we need in order to get uh, within 10% of this exact answer? So what we want to do is we want to find the exact answer of this. So for this, what we want to do is integrate this polynomial, pretending that this doesn't exist for the starters. So we want to raise the power and then divide it by the power, as we do with a regular polynomial. But because of this chain rule um, comparison that we have with our derivative, um, instead of multiplying with the derivative of the inside like we do for uh, the chain rule for differentiation, we want to divide by the derivative of the function inside. So this is what I've done here. I've raised the power, I've divided it by the power, and then the derivative of the inside is, that goes to zero and that just goes to one. So we're just dividing by one, as you can see here. Uh, and then when we simplify this down and stick in some numbers, we were allowed a calculator this year, thank goodness, because we have a 1.1 to the power of 10. I do not fancy doing that in my head. Um, but we ended up with this answer, 0.159374. So the next part of the question says that we want our result to be within 10% of this. So it's useful to work out uh, what bounds our 10% accuracy. So that means we want 1.59374 plus or minus 10%. And in order to work at 10%, I'm sure you know that you just multiply it by the decimal version of 10%, which is 0 0.1 or 0 0.10, if you find that easier to think of as a 10. Um, and then we end up with our bounds being between 0 0.1434 and 0 0.1753. So Next, what we need to do is we need to understand that the question is asking us how much do we need to expand this thing here, so inside our integral, using the binomial expansion. So what that's going to look like is once we find our binomial uh, coefficients for 9, which is a lot, <laughs> then it'll look something like this inside our integral would be split like so. So with integrals, if we're adding up, we are able to bring the integral before each one of these terms and it won't change our answer. And then this means that we can look at what these individual integrals come to in value and keep adding them on until we reach within this bound here. But because we're starting with bigger numbers and shrinking down and shrinking down at each term, it's basically when we surpass this number. Oh, and also it's worth saying that when you have a question like this, where they ask you how many terms do you need to add on, it's important to start with the term that's going to come out the largest. So in this case, the x to the power of naught term will come out the largest because we're putting in this 0 0.1. 
Um, so if we raise 0.1 to a higher and higher power, we'll get a smaller and smaller number because it's less than one. So our first term, we get 0.1, and that is not yet between our bounds. Then the second term, we get 0.045, and I've created this running total down the bottom. Uh, and this is larger than our 0.1434 bound. So we only need up to the extra the power of one term. And that answers your question. Okay, next is just some practice of different methods uh, for integrals. So this first question, there are always several methods for performing an integration. But for this one, I found the easiest method was to use uh, substitution. But you might be wondering, how do I choose um, what I should use as a substitution? Well, you have to think about your steps for a substitution. So for me, I chose to substitute all of the sine x's with a u. But when you're replacing with a u, you want to replace this dx as well, don't you? And the reason I picked sine x was because I knew once I rearranged um, this du by dx, I would get cos x, which would cancel out with the top cos x. So I would only end up with things in terms of u within my, my integral. But truthfully, spotting this just takes a little bit of practice. So try and think about what can I remove easily? So in this, it's easy to divide by cos x, get rid of cos x. It's slightly harder to divide, uh, to multiply by one plus sine x to get rid of one plus sine x. And I think that's kind of how I spotted that it was sine x differentiated in for cos x that would get rid of my cos x. So I said that u is sine x. I've differentiated uh, u to get cos x and then rearranged this to get dx to replace this dx here. It's also important to remember when you use substitution method that you need to change your bounds. So if our u is sine x, then we use these x values, I suppose, to find your top bound and bottom bound. So your top bound was sine pi over 2, and your bottom bound was sine 0. So that our bounds were 1 and 0. And then you can see here that the causes cancel and you end up with a very simple integral, which is just um, one over u plus one between one and zero. So when you integrate one over x uh, dx, uh, remember that you don't move this up to the top and get a one over minus one, because otherwise when we try and integrate that uh, in the polynomial way, we'll end up with this and that doesn't exist. You can't divide by zero. So in this case, that goes to ln x. And here we end up with ln two minus ln one, which you can either remember that ln one is zero, or if you'd rather think about it this way, then you can do it like that to get ln two. Okay, so the next part, um, we have uh, another, equation here that doesn't look too complicated so with this one there might be the temptation to bring the x squared plus 6x plus 8 to the top um, but our product rule for integration is a little bit complicated um, if you've not seen it before then I'll just write it here but what it says is if we have an integral uh, ux times vx dx then the integral would be u multiplied by v minus uh, the integral of v du by dx dx. But we can end up in a perpetual loop of integrals if we do it like this. So we want to find a slightly less complicated way of doing it. And the best way of doing this is to use partial fractions. So I'm sure you have all uh, done partial fractions in school already, but we just split this. Uh, so first we want to factorize the bottom, and then we want to call our fraction here something over one of these factors plus something over the other factor. And then if we multiply everything by x plus 4 and multiply everything by x plus 2, then we end up with something like this. And then we just set x to some values that will cancel out a and b 
to get values for a and b and then we can pop those back on the top of our fractions and then this is a much simpler thing to integrate we just have our lns again um and then you can look through my maths here if you like to get the answer but it's just manipulating logarithms which if you've watched my first video you'll be a pro at by now so the next point on the syllabus is about using calculus um, to describe points and graphs such as minima, maxima, and the slope. So for this, I didn't really want to find questions to go through this because I feel like if you've studied calculus before, you already know um, that the derivative tells you about the slope of a graph. So for example, if we have an equation y equals 5x squared plus 2x plus 3 and then we plot that excuse my laziness i just use desmos graphing calculator um then we can see that we have this graph and at different points it has different gradients so over here we have a negative gradient because our graph is sloping down down the bottom here we have a zero gradient um, and then up here we have a positive gradient and at the point where we have a zero gradient that is called a minimum so we observe a minimum here at minus 0 0.2 at uh, 2.8. But how do we know uh, where that was? Well, the way that we know that it's there is to inspect the gradient and ask ourselves, where in looking at this equation, do we have a gradient or a slope of zero? So we want to work out a general expression for the slope using the derivative. So we take the derivative of y to get the slope. And then if we set that to zero, we can find out the x value where this minimum occurs. So here, as it shows in the graph, it happens that x is minus 0 0.2. And then for the y value, you would just stick that minus 0 0.2 back into your equation and you should end up with 2.8. So calculus has several uses. Um, we can either use it practically, I suppose, to tell us something about the slope or the area of a graph, um, the slope coming from the derivative, the area coming from the integral. Um, and this can be useful in all sorts of different graphs, such as velocity time graphs or distant time graphs, etc., cetera, because uh, the slope and the area could tell you some physical values. But also more generally, we can use uh, differentiation as the reverse of integration and integration as the reverse of differentiation. And this question kind of exploits that. So if we look at this uh, integral, it's actually quite complicated to work out. There are several terms here. Uh, we can't merge these two together because this is a uh, square root and this is to the power of one. So we need to try and find um, a different relationship between them. And if you're astute, you will notice that this is actually the first derivative of this here. And in order to work out the integral of this, it's easier to try and think of this in reverse and think about what's happened. So during the chain rule, we differentiated a function of a function. Um, and then multiplied that by the derivative of the internal function. And this is kind of what it looks like happened here. We've multiplied this by the derivative of this. So it kind of looks like we did the chain rule. We've already done the chain rule on this. We want to go back to something that we've already differentiated. So if we think about uh, the form of the uh, chain rule that I gave earlier, I said that if we are to differentiate uh, g, which is a function of f, which is a function of x, um, then we end up with something in this form. So if we want to go the other way, we start with this, then we divide by this, and then we integrate this to end up with g f of x. So we divide by f dash x, or we divide by the internal function that we differentiated. And then we integrate our g dash as if f of x is just some constant and that we can just ignore that. So if we do that here, we say, okay, we want to divide by this and we want to integrate this 
uh, as if this is just kind of an X or something. So we raise the power by one and then divide by the new power. And then I've just put the function back in. So this, um, so this X squared minus six X plus eight to get our integral. And then we just stick in the numbers. Um, this can be really hard to get your head around in the first place. So don't worry if you didn't grasp that straight away, but just try and remember that every rule that you've used to differentiate something, if we go backwards, we do the opposite to the steps that we took to differentiate it. So if you want to integrate it, we take the opposite steps to what we did to differentiate it. Okay, so this next question is one that can either go really well or really wrong, depending on whether you notice something. So what we want to do is we have this function and we want to integrate this first part uh, with respect to x, easy peasy. Then sub in our 2t squared and our zero, and we end up with this. And then if we differentiate everything with respect to t, we end up with our answer. Now, the temptation and where this can go very wrong is to bring this d by dt in uh, and then differentiate first and then integrate what we've got left. Uh, and we end up with a different answer, which might be surprising. But actually, it's not surprising because when we did this, when we moved this dt in, we completely bypassed this t that was up here because this will have an effect on what is being placed in here. But we've popped that in after we've already done this differentiation step. So just be careful that if you're given a question that involves both differentiation and integration, the order is really important. So the first one you want to do is the one that is not going to affect the next one. So for this, the integration, uh, we're integrating with respect to x. And the only x here is in here. So we can know that we can safely do that. Um, without affecting the differentiation that's to come later, because that's just with respect to t. But it will also simplify things down as well, because you won't have an x to deal with when you're doing your differentiation with respect to t. So I've kind of briefly mentioned this earlier on in the video, but uh, integration is also used to work out the area underneath um, a line on a graph or underneath a curve. I suppose using it underneath the line would be a little bit redundant because you can work that out in much easier ways, but it is very useful for a curve because if I asked you to work out the area under a straight line graph between oh, 0 and 1, 1, you'd say, well, that's easy. That's just 1 times 1 divided by 2 because it's a triangle. But if I asked you to work out the area underneath a slope like this, well, it's not so easy to work out in your head. So that's where we use integration, is we have a equation that describes that curve, and then we can integrate that to work out the area underneath it. So this question uh, asks us to sketch two curves, um, label the point of intersection, and calculate the area between the two curves. So they've given us little steps here. First thing we want to do is we want to sketch. So I've sketched my two graphs here. And if you've watched my first video, you'll be a professional at graph sketching. So you won't question this step. <laughs> Next, we need to find the points of intersection. So they intersect when their values are the same. So if we equate these, if we say, okay, if when is y equals x squared and x is y squared, well, if we put, we can also say that x squared is y to the power of four. So if we pop that in here, when is that true? And that is only true when x is naught and x is one, which looking at our graph here seems to make sense. So I've labeled those points of intersection. And then finally, we want to work out the area between the curves. So that is going to be this area here. And you can probably just intuitively see where that area is you can see that it is total area underneath here without the total area that's underneath here. 
So we want to do the area under y squared is x minus the area underneath y equals x squared between 0 and 1. So I found the easiest thing to do was to make both of the equations y equals something and then integrate y between 0 and 1. So for the first area, uh, we want to integrate underneath the line y squared equals x or y equals root x. Um, and then just using the polynomial rules, we end up with 2 over 3. And then the second area we need to work out is the area under y equals x squared. So we integrate x squared with respect to x using the polynomial rule again, and we end up with a third. And then we just take one away from the other and we end up with a third as our answer. Then this next question is very similar again. This time we're given one curve and one line and we want to find the area between them. So the first step again, I would say would be to sketch. And then like we did in the previous uh, question, look for the points of intersection. And for this question, since we have a point of intersection at zero, one and minus one, um, there is symmetry. So we can just look at this right hand side and then multiply that area by two as opposed to doing two integrals basically. So you can either integrate under the y equals x line or you can just say, well, that's a triangle <laughs> um, and you'll get an area of a half. And then you want to do the same thing for your curve. So you want to integrate x squared with respect to dx between one and naught, and you'll end up with a third. Then you want to take one away from the other and remembering that we were only looking at one side. So we have to multiply this by two to take into account the left hand side as well. And we end up with a total area of a third. So this last section is kind of a method for simplifying a lot of your integrals. And that is to notice whether your function is odd or even. So, for example, say we have a sine graph, which looks something like this about the zero. Well, this is an odd function. And that means that technically we have an area here. And then we have an equal but opposite area on this side. So if we integrate between these two bounds, then we'll get area A and we'll get minus area A. And when we add them both together, we'll end up with a total of zero. And then if we look at an even function, so say cos, and then we look between 90 and minus 90, you'll see that we have two symmetrical sides, but this time they are both positive areas. So we end up with a total of two times the right-hand area or the left-hand area. So using this idea, uh, we can quickly work out uh, whether these functions will be zero or non-zero. But remember, this is only true if they are between the same bounds. If we just go from 90 degrees to, I don't know, minus 107, <laughs> then, okay, these two areas cancel out, but we still have this leftover area. So this only works when uh, our two bounds are, the, are equal and opposite, which it happens to be for all of these here. So this is the case where we're looking for odd and even symmetry. So if we look at the first one, we know that x squared is an even function. It looks like this. But we know that sine x is an odd function. If we multiply an even function and an odd function, we end up with an odd function. So uh, this next function is an even function. Uh, but if you're struggling to work out whether it's an odd or an even function, think about what happens as you have positive values. So as you have positive values, you have a, a decreasing exponential, I suppose. So you have something that looks a little bit like this. And then as we have negative values of x, what's happening? Well, it's squared, so our y values will be the same on the other side. So it's symmetrical, it's even. Okay, this next one again, we have a cos squared. Cos in itself is an even function, 
but then when we square it, it remains that both sides are still positive. So uh, it's still even. This one here, we worked out that the e to the minus x squared was even from before, and then x is odd. And if we multiply something odd by something even, we end up with something odd. And I find the best way to remember what happens when you multiply an odd and an even is to think about what happens when you multiply negative numbers. So imagine that your even number is a positive number and imagine that your odd number is a negative number. If you multiply a positive number and a positive number, you still get a positive number. If you multiply a positive number and a negative number, then you end up with a negative number. And if you multiply two negative numbers, you end up with a positive number. So if you multiply even and even, you get even. If you multiply odd and even, you get odd. And if you multiply odd and odd, you get even. And since they're all between symmetrical bounds again, we can say that every odd one becomes a zero and every even becomes a non-zero. So two and three are the non-zero ones. So A is our answer. Oh, just be careful that you read this properly as well, because sometimes they'll ask for non-zero and sometimes they'll ask for zero, as you'll see in the next question. So this next question is asking which of the following integrals are equal to zero. So you're welcome to pause the video here um, and see if you can work this out for yourself. Uh, and I will just go through my solutions now. So the first one, uh, we have x cubed. Think about what x cubed looks like. It looks something like that, uh, which is odd. And then uh, e to the minus x squared in the previous question, we worked out that was even. Here we have x, which is odd, multiplied by a sine, which is odd. So we get an even. And then the last one, we have x, which is odd, multiplied by cos, which is even, which makes it odd. Uh, and our odds are zero, because remember, this one's asking which ones are equal to zero, not which ones are non-zero. So that means that i1 and i4 are our zeros. So I hope that this video was shorter than the previous one um, and that you found this whistle-stop tour through calculus to be helpful. And in the next video, I'm going to be going through mechanics.